Hi everyone. I promised in this lecture to just go through the plot of The Tempest with you. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do here. Quite a narrative lecture, in other words, not much analysis. Uh, and one of the things I will do is just to flag all the scenes that I think are important and that we'll, we'll get back to as we continue talking about the play in subsequent lectures. So, to jump right in, uh, the play starts with the cast of characters and we are told that the setting is an uninhabited island. Which is already interesting because of course Ariel and Sycorax and Caliban were all there before Prosper arrived with his daughter Miranda. What is the idea, what is the belief in forming this idea that the island is uninhabited? Why call it uninhabited if it's not? And then a storm strikes a ship carrying Alonso, Ferdinand, Sebastian, uh, Antonio, Gonzalo and um, Stefano and Trinculo who are on their way to Italy after coming from the wedding of Alonso's daughter Clarabel to the Prince of Tunis in Africa. Curiously international uh, play considering you know, you've, you've got Africa, you've got Europe, Italy um, but the setting, of course, is very local. It's just this one island, which is almost like a prison. And the, the royal party and the other mariners, um, except for the, the captain, the boat, Swain, who, who is unflappable, begin to fear for their lives. Lightning is cracking, uh, the waves are in turmoil. And the mariners cry that the ship has been hit and everyone prepares to sink. Now the storm is clearly symbolic, right? It represents disorder in nature. Uh, and it's also the catalyst that sets the plot in motion. This idea of a storm representing disorder in nature is very typical uh, of the Elizabethan period, the early modern period. Whenever you see a storm, uh, in literature of that time you know that the idea of disorder is being evoked and concomitantly perhaps the idea that order needs to be restored but of course it's also a storm that Prospero creates right so there's something interesting going on here which we will get back to soon uh, Miranda and Prospero are standing on the shore of the island and looking out to sea at the, at the recent shipwreck and Miranda asks her father to do anything he can uh, to help the poor souls on the ship. If by your art, my dearest father, you have put the wild waters in this roar, she suspects that her father is responsible for the storm, which is interesting. Allay them. The sky it seems to pour down stinking pitch, but that the sea mounting to the welkin's cheek dashes the fire out. Oh, I have suffered with those that I saw suffer a brave vessel who had no doubt some noble creature in her dashed all to pieces. So, right, we, in, in this introduction to Miranda, we also see that she is very empathetic. She feels what others are feeling. She's quite imaginative, maybe a bit idealistic or romantic. She imagines that the ship must have some noble creature on it. Um, and she's generally just, you know, a, a, a very nice young person. And Prospero tells her to be collected, no more amazement, tell your piteous heart there is no harm done interesting here that everything that he says is in the imperative right they're all instructions be collected stop being amazed tell your piteous heart and so on <clears throat> so he assures her that everything is all right and then he informs her that it's time she learned more about herself and her past which i guess is a slightly funny thing to do under the circumstances and this is a story that he uh, has often started to tell her before we learn, but uh, never managed to finish. And the story goes that Prospero 
was the Duke of Milan until his brother Antonio, conspiring with Alonso, the king of Naples, usurped his position. So these people are all on the ship, right? Uh, uh, Antonio, Alonso, and Gonzalo, who helped Prospero to escape um, with his daughter, and very importantly, with the books that are the source of his magic and power. So Gonzalo is a good guy. And Prosper and his daughter arrived on the island where they still are um, when the play starts and where they have been for 12 years. This number 12 keeps coming up in the play. 12 years, especially quite, quite important. Except Prosper says fortune has at last sent uh, his enemies his way. And he admits that he raised the tempest using Ariel in order to make things right with him once and for all. And we don't quite know what this means. Is he uh, looking for revenge? Is he looking for closure? What is it that he's up to? And uh, you know what's interesting here is that as much as The Tempest is Shakespeare's plot device, it's also Prospero's. It's Prospero who invokes The, the Tempest. It's almost and I've said this before in another context, as if Prospero is a surrogate playwright. He controls everyone's fate. You could even say that there's something about him that's a bit like a dictator as well as a playwright. Now, after telling this uh, story, Prospero charms Miranda to sleep. You see why I say there's something a bit dictatorial about his, his powers. How would you feel if your father could just kind of snap his fingers and make you sleep? And he calls Ariel, who is his familial spirit, his, his kind of chief magical agent. Or if you want to read the play in quite a dark way, you could say he's sort of like the uh, chief of um, Prospero Secret Service. And Prosper and Ariel's discussion reveals that Ariel brought the tempest upon the ship and set fire to the mast at, at Prospero's instructions. And he then made sure that everyone got safely to the island, although they are now separated from each other into small groups. I think there's a kind of divide and rule going on here. But also a chess game, it's a, as if all the characters are chess pieces who have been placed uh, in, on different parts of the board. And a bit late in the play, the, this metaphor, this idea of the chase game kind of comes up. And Ariel, who's in fact a captive servant to Prospero, reminds his master that he promised Ariel freedom a year early if uh, he willingly performed tasks such as this one, the sinking of the ship without complaining. So Ariel says, Is there more toil since thou dost give me pains? Let me remember thee what thou hast promised, which is not yet performed me. Prospero sounds quite annoyed. How now, Moody? What is it thou canst demand? Not what is it that you want, what is it that you are allowed, what is it that you can demand? Uh, Ariel says, my liberty and Prospero gets more and more annoyed before the time be out. No more, dost thou forget from what a torment I did free thee? Hast thou forgot the foul witch Sycorax, who with age and envy was grown into a hoop? Hast thou forgot her? He freed Ariel from a tree, right, where Sycorax imprisoned him for a very long time. This is the only scene where it looks as if Prospero... Uh, is angry with Ariel as if their relationship isn't quite perfect. <laughs> Just waiting for the alarm to pass beneath my office. <laughs> okay. After Ariel assures Prospero that he knows his place, Prospero orders Ariel to take the shape of a sea nymph and to make himself invisible to everyone except Prosper himself. So you see what I mean when I say there's something a little bit sinister about Prospero and something ambivalent about his idea of 
freedom. He freed Ariel, so Ariel's responsible to prosper for his freedom. But Ariel is also kind of his slave, he's his servant, so he's also not free. Now Miranda wakes up from her sleep and she and Prospero go to visit Caliban, an important character, Prospero's servant, like Ariel but also not like Ariel in that respect, and the son of the dead Sycorax who imprisoned Ariel. And Caliban curses Prospero uh, and Prospero and Miranda berate him for being ungrateful for everything that they've given and taught him. We'll visit Caliban, my slave, who never yields us a kind answer. And Miranda, tis a villain, so I do not love to look on. So, he's quite ugly as far as they're concerned. Uh, but as it is, we cannot miss him, which I also think is interesting. He does make our fire, fetch in our wood, and serves in offices that profit us. What oh, slave Caliban, thou earth, thou speak. Caliban is associated with the earth and aerial uh, with uh, air. Yeah, so he's horrible. And they don't like him. Uh, he should be grateful for everything they've done for him. But they also need him. So in this scene, one of the things that Caliban says is, you taught me language. In other words, you taught me how to speak. And my profit on it, the only thing that I got from it, is I know how to curse. And then the red plague rid you for learning me your language. In other words, he wishes he didn't understand language. Your language, the language that Prospero taught him. And here we get uh, uh, Prospero's justification for enslaving Caliban. He says, Thou most lying slave whom stripes may move, not kindness, the stripes you get when someone hits you. I have used thee filth as thou art with humane care and lodged thee in mine own cell till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. So Prospero is telling us that he treated him with kindness, he even allowed him to stay with him in his own uh, room, his own cell, until Caliban tried to violate the honor of his child, so he tried to rape Miranda, and this is why uh, they feel justified in treating him in this way. Then after we introduce to Caliban, Ariel comes onto the stage and he's playing music and leading Ferdinand, who is pretty amazed by everything. And Miranda and Ferdinand immediately become infatuated with each other. <laughs> he's the only man Miranda's ever seen besides Caliban and her father. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say about this. She moves fast. Now this is all part of Prospero's plan. He wants his daughter to marry Ferdinand. Why? Well, partly, of course, he wants his daughter to be happy. Uh, but her marriage to Ferdinand would also be politically useful to Prospero and advance his plot, as, as well as the plot of the play. Uh, so yet again the plot of the narrative and Prospero's scheme, his plot, become indistinguishable. You can almost ask, is Shakespeare writing this love story or is Prospero? Uh, and uh, you know, incidentally, this kind of arranged marriage for status and influence was very typical of the Elizabethan period. But Prospero needs Miranda to think that she is in charge, that she's falling in love for real. He doesn't want her to realize that in fact it's, it's something that he's doing. And he decides that he must introduce an obstacle to slow things down. So he accuses Ferdinand of impersonating the Prince of Naples and says he's going to imprison him. 
<coughs> so he says he isn't really who he says he is. Uh, and says he's going to put him in prison. Well, there's a lot of imprisonment on this island. Which is also something we'll get back to. The threat of prison, the reality of prison. The island itself as a kind of prison. In fact, the stage ultimately as, as a kind of prison. Now, and Ferdinand draws his sword to defend himself, but Prospero enchants him um, and takes him to prison, ignoring uh, Miranda's pleading to pardon him. And then he sends Ariel off on another errand, but at this point we don't know what it is. Now, th this is typical of courtly love, Petrarchan love. Uh, which in turn is typical of Elizabethan um, love stories. So it, it involves introducing obstacles to the fulfillment of a relationship. And yet again, Prospero is employing a literary device towards his own political and personal ends. And you see here again how the literary and the real become indistinguishable. So we have a kind of a Petrarchan or a courtly love story with an obstacle uh, to, to, to the achievement of this idealized romantic love um, but it's something that Prospero consciously introduces Ariel comes on stage and he's visible to us the audience but not to the characters and he plays music that puts everyone except Sebastian and Antonio to sleep and Sebastian and Antonio who are not good guys then begin talking about the benefits of murdering Alonso remember Alonso was partly responsible for usurping Prospero's position and forcing him into exile <clears throat> and Antonio's argument is that Sebastian can become the ruler of Naples if they get rid of Alonso so the two of them are about to stab all the sleeping men to death when Ariel wakes Gonzalo up and he shouts and everyone wakes up and notices what's going on and then Antonio and Sebastian come up with this frankly insane story about trying to protect the king from lions uh, who have conveniently run off now and Ariel returns uh, to Prosper and Alonso and the rest of them go off to keep looking for Ferdinand So here we have the theme of betrayal, right? It's a very Machiavellian world where nobody can be trusted. All this court intrigue. Then we return to Caliban, who is carrying wood for Prospero and then stumbles on Trinculo, right? Trinculo and Stefano are servants and they're portrayed in a sort of stereotypical way as comic figures who can't control their appetites and he immediately thinks that Chinkilo is one of the spirits that Prospero sends to plague him you see how Prospero keeps everyone under control by kind of directing their reality in an essentially virtual way we talked about in, in a previous lecture and Caliban lies down and hides under his cloak Trinkler wants to escape from a storm that's coming up and he crawls under the cloak with Caliban even though Caliban <coughs> smells terrible and looks really strange and then Stefano arrives he's singing and drunk and he stumbles on this strange tableau of Caliban and Trinculo under the cloak Caliban hears the singing and he thinks it's another one of Prospero's spirits and he says he'll work faster if the spirits will just leave him alone Stefano decides this monster needs some booze and he tries to get Caliban drunk uh, and soon the three are sitting up together and drinking. So there's a kind of allegiance forming between the servants and Caliban at this point, a fragile allegiance. Then Prosper puts Ferdinand to work carrying wood. Ferdinand actually enjoys this chore because it's for Miranda's sake, you know, he's completely lovesick. Again, you have this Petrarchan uh, idea of love, courtly love, almost 
a form of masochism. It's like, oh, I enjoy getting hurt. I enjoy suffering because it's in the service of love. <clears throat> Miranda pops up. She thinks her father is asleep and she tells Ferdinand to rest a bit and they start flirting. It's interesting because this is the one scene where Miranda thinks she's disobeying her father. She's being disobedient, even though she's doing exactly what he wants. He wants her to disobey him. The next thing, you know, two minutes later, Miranda asks Ferdinand to marry her. Um, and he accepts. So Ferdinand says, wherefore weep you? And Miranda says, at mine unworthiness that dare not offer what I desire to give, and much less take what I shall die to want. It's a very complicated answer to a simple question. Why are you crying? She's saying, I'm not worthy to offer what I want to offer. Uh, and I can't take what I shall die to want, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm dying for. The word die, incidentally, is also an Elizabethan metaphor for uh, orgasm. So in the speech, there's this constant allusion to something quite sexual kind of happening beneath the surface. But this is trifling. And the, m the more it seeks to hide itself, the bigger bulk it shows. You know, the more I try not talking about this thing, the more it makes itself present. And then she talks to herself, oh, hence bashful cunning and prompt me plain and holy innocence. I'm starting to wonder if she's really as innocent as she claims here. This is quite a clever little speech. I am your wife, she says, if you will marry me. If not, I'll die your maid. Oh, this word die again. I am your wife, if you will marry, if you want to marry me, I'll be your wife, and if not, I will, I will die a virgin, I will die um, committed to you, but she could also be offering to have sex with him, right, if not, I'll die your maid, you can have me anyway, I will have, um, I will, I will have an orgasm in your arm. <laughs> To be your fellow, you may deny me, but I'll be your servant, whether you will or no. And that sounds almost ominous. I'll be your servant, whether you want me to or not. So she's actually proposing marriage to Ferdinand, which is a, a little bit unusual for Elizabethan times. And as I said, there's something quite physical, something kind of embodied beneath this, this speech. Uh, and we also see that Miranda's quite clever. She's managing to, to propose to Ferdinand in, in a, a way that's quite convoluted. Uh, and that at the same time maintains this image of her as, as kind of innocent and virginal. Ferdinand doesn't look, he doesn't seem quite as smart as Miranda. He's just like this bloke kind of stumbling around. Oh, why are you crying? Miranda goes off. <laughs> it's really complicated. Um, the, the tangent where she basically proposes to him. Now, while all of this was going on, Prospero's actually uh, been on stage, but invisible to them. And he's really chuffed with what's going on because in fact, even though Miranda thinks she's defying him, this has been his plan all along. Now, Stefano uh, and Trinkler and Caliban are by now completely wasted, and Ariel adds to the chaos by impersonating their voices and kind of goading them with in, uh, insults. And it, again, we see the power of illusions to mediate reality. It seems almost like Prospero's main form of control is not so much coercion, but he, he uses that too, right? He, he beats the, uh, Caliban, for instance. But it's not so much coercion as illusion. In fact, what Karl Marx would call false consciousness hundreds of years later. So he controls people through, through, through their mind uh, by inhabiting their consciousness in some way. 
and making them feel as if they're freely choosing something that is in fact something that Prospero wants them to do. Now, Caliban is really drunk at this point and he brags enthusiastically that he knows how to murder Prospero. So his plan is that they kill Prospero take his daughter and then set Stefano up as king of, of the island. It's funny, even though Caliban has this opportunity to rule his own island, he defers to Stefano for some reason. And of course Stefano thinks it's a good plan and the three prepare to set off to find Prospero. And then they sidetracked again by the music that Ariel plays on his flute and uh, a table drum and they decide to follow this music before they execute their plot. So these three are obviously comic characters but note how the aristocrats on the island are actually behaving in a very similar way. They're also scheming, they also want to murder people uh, for, for power and for political gain. So the subplot with Stefano, Trinkel and Caliban actually mirrors and comments on the behavior of the royal party. Also quite typical of Shakespeare's plays that the comic subplot mirrors and, and comments on the, the main plot. And just note, you know, in, in Caliban's plan, he says, you, know, you may brain him, meaning, you know, hit his brains out, having first seized his books or with a log, batter his skull, or paunch him with a stake, or cut his wheeze out with a knife. It's very violent, and he obviously really hates it. But then he gets back to the books. Remember first to possess his books, for without them he is but a sot, as I am. Without his books, he's just like me. And hath not one spirit to command. He, he won't be able to command spirits. They all do hate him as rootedly as I, so he's actually claiming that Ariel hates him as much as he does. And then he gets back to the books again. Burn but his books. So the text remains incredibly important. You know, the physical world is almost held in bondage to the written in this play. We see this constant reiteration, if you want, of the priority of the signifier. And Caliban understands that a blow against the book is a blow against Prospero's power. You could almost say that the idea of the author becomes conflated with the idea of authority, authority, power and books, the written word, uh, and agency are very closely related. Now Alonso, Gonzalo, Sebastian and Antonio become tired from walking around looking for Ferdinand and they stop for a rest. But Antonio and Sebastian haven't given up on their plan to murder Alonso and Gonzalo. And they plan to kill them in the evening, um, taking advantage of, of, of the fact that they're tired. And then Prospero, who's probably on the balcony of the stage uh, and invisible to the men, but again visible to us, to the audience, causes a banquet to be set up by strangely shaped spirits. And as the men prepare to eat, Ariel appears like a harpy and he causes the banquet to vanish. And then he accuses the men of deposing Prospero and he says that this is why Alonso's son, Ferdinand, has been removed. So he's implying that he's dead, even though he isn't really. And then Ariel vanishes and Alonso is left um, feeling disturbed and guilty. And at this point Prospero adopts um, a more conciliatory attitude towards Ferdinand and he welcomes him into his family as Miranda's prospective husband. He says, then as my gift 
but look at the language he uses. If you're a woman, what would you feel like if your father said this about you? Then as my gift and thine own acquisition worthily purchased, take my daughter. He makes her sound like property. But, he says, if thou dost break her virgin not before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right be ministered, no sweet aspersion shall the heavens let fall to make this contract grow, but barren hate, sour eye, disdain, and discord shall I bestrew the union of your bed with weed so loathly that you shall hate it both. Therefore take heed as Hyman's lamps shall light you. In other words, don't sleep with my daughter before you marry her. Uh, again, this is quite a... <laughs> It's quite an extreme kind of thing to say to someone, to your daughter's prospective husband. Uh, and also, look at the economic language he uses. He talks about no sweet aspersions um, shall the heavens set forth to make this contract grow. Then Prospero tells Ariel to invoke some spirits to perform a mask for Ferdinand Miranda, like a little play inside a play. And the spirits come in the shapes of Ceres, uh, Juno and Iris, and they perform this short mask praising the rights of marriage and fertility. But then while this is going on, Prospero suddenly remembers that um, he still needs to stop Caliban's plot against him. And he quickly terminates this performance and he sends his spirits away and asks Ariel about Trinculo, Stefano and Caliban and Ariel tells his master of the three men's plans that they made while they were drunk and Ariel and Prospero then set a trap by hanging beautiful clothing in Prospero's cell. Stefano, Trinculo and Caliban enter looking for Prospero and instead they find the beautiful clothes and they decide to steal it and they're immediately set upon by a pack of spirits in the shape of dogs and hounds and this pack of spirits is driven on by Prospero and Ariel. Then Prospero uses Ariel to bring Alonso and the others before him. Remember they still think Ferdinand is dead. And he sends Ariel to bring the boatswain and the mariners from where they're still sleeping on the wrecked ship. And then he confronts uh, Alonso, Antonio and Sebastian with their treachery. But importantly, he tells them that he forgives them. Alonso tells him of having lost Ferdinand in the tempest. And Prosper says that he recently lost his own daughter, again kind of implying that she's dead. But then he clarifies his meaning by drawing aside a curtain to reveal Ferdinand and Miranda who are busy, well what are they busy with? They're playing chess. How weird is that? Remember I talked about the idea of chess at the beginning of this lecture? Why are they playing chess? We'll just file that away for later as well. You'd expect them to be kissing or something. This is just weird. And Alonso and his companions are amazed by the miracle of Ferdinand's survival. And Miranda is stunned by the sight of people unlike any she's seen before. And Ferdinand then tells his own father about his marriage. Then Ariel returns with the boatswain and the mariners. And the boatswain tells the story of having been awakened from a sleep that had apparently lasted since the tempest. And then Prospero instructs um, Ariel to release Caliban and Trinculo and Stefano who then enter wearing the clothes that they stole. And Prospero and Alonso command them to return the clothes and to clean up Prospero's cell and Prospero invites Alonso and the others to stay for the night so that he can tell them the tale of his life uh, over the last uh, 12 years. And after this the, the group plans to return to Italy and Prospero, who's restored to his dukedom, um, plans to retire to Milan. And then Prospero gives Ariel one final task to make sure that the seas are calm for the return voyage um, before he, sets, he finally sets him free. 
Right, so that, that very briefly is the, the plot of The Tempest. And in the next video lecture, I will talk to you uh, about the major themes. And I want to talk to you about Caliban and the idea of colonialism, especially. And we'll also talk a little bit more about Miranda and the position of women in this, in this play. Okay, bye.